Hey, welcome to the podcast. Now today I have a treat for you. First, I want to just acknowledge that it is uh, Women's History Month, and today, the day this episode is coming out, is International Women's Day, and I have an incredible woman to introduce you to. So if you have ever had an idea for a TV show, or you've already, you're have already you sitting on a pilot that you wrote two years ago, or you just finished writing one just now, or you've ever even thought about like what's it like to pitch a TV show, today's guest is going to walk you through that mysterious process. So Adrienne Rose White, she's an actress in her own right. Uh, she's in a movie uh, coming out from Anna Perner with Amy Adams. And But we really focused our conversation around pitching television shows because she helps people, all kinds of content creators and even newbies to content creation, pitch their shows to studios, production companies, and to networks. And there's actually a very different approach you take with those different things, which I learned in this conversation today. And one of the things that I love about Adrian is she is incredibly generous with what exactly happened for her and where you can have an expectation and where you need to throw your expectations out the window. One of the things I love about her approach around this is around how to, the way she calls her course, for example, illustrates this beautifully, I think. It's how to actually sell a TV show organically. Um, and so she really believes in the power of relationship and in the power of, you know, creating a community that then becomes what helps to lift off your project. Now, that can sound like, yeah, you talk about that all the time, Brian. But in today's conversation, we're talking about, again, that backstage pass to getting a TV actually made. So how is the sausage made? How do you go from I have an idea to getting a yes from Netflix or from Paramount? And Adrian's been through this process on her own multiple times, selling quite a few shows and then with some of her clients as well. So let's not take up any more time. Let's jump right in so we all can get better at this skill. And hey, wait, if you're never going to pitch a TV show, you're still going to learn a lot from this episode because Adrian walks us through the key steps to take when you're building a relationship. Okay, let's do this. So Adrian Rose White, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. It's so good to be here, Brian. <laughs> I'm like looking forward to this. Me too. You know, we've known each other for a long time. I tried to think about when we met because I, you know, I think you were my, you were one of my clients or one of the people when I was in that, when I was doing a group coaching program a while ago. But I'm coming up on my 13 year anniversary in LA. It's coming up in April, um, and so, and I think that I the time that I was doing that was probably like eight year, eight or nine years ago. Is that? I, I, I just had my 10 year, 10 year LA anniversary in January. Okay. So that feels, and I feel like I wasn't getting my shit together until about at least a year in. So, <laughs> so Might have been around that. At least nine years, maybe eight, Got eight it. or nine. Yeah. Got it. And Adrian, when I knew you, you were a an actress and also you had this writing thing going on and then it like in from the outside world just like oh my gosh Adrian right it just all took off for her and we know on the outside that's what it looks like oh she's suddenly a 10 with everything she's doing right we know on the inside there was a lot more work to how it all came to be and I so I know a lot of people who are listening today they're either actors who are thinking about writing or they're writers who are thinking about pitching or they just want to know more about what it is to pitch a television show or they've got their idea that they're sitting on or they just are interested in how tea, how the sausage is made, right? So I would love for you to just to get us started before we get too deep into that. Tell us a little bit more about your story of how it all came to be that this is, this is what you know how to do now and something that you're um, continually doing. Like This is the thing that you do. Can you walk us through a little bit of your story then? Yeah, absolutely. And just to ask, how far back do you want me to go? Because I can do the like from Chesterfield, Missouri version, or I could do the like from LA version. What'd well, I think you should give us a, why don't you give us a little hybrid? Will you give us a little hybrid just to how, and, and kind of with the, with the, with the blinders on around like writing, like how did writing emerge? I think that would be a good way to walk through it, you know, like, and, and maybe this is the first time you've thought through the story, which will even be more exciting to the listeners. Okay. Okay. I got you. So yeah. I, uh, so I grew up in Chesterfield, Missouri, almost as exciting as it sounds. Um, and, you know, went to college on the East coast. Um, and after that, I felt like I'd spent my whole life living, uh, focused on academics. Like I was very academically oriented, very achievement oriented. Um, and I really burned out of that. Like I, when I left college, I just felt like I hadn't cultivated other part of my spirituality, I hadn't cultivated my creativity. I, I had, but not as much as I could. Um, so after a stint of tutoring in Korea, um, I went to an ashram in India where I studied yoga and they had a talent show. And being the type A joint, like 
you know, go getter that I am, I volunteered to host the talent show and no one volunteered to perform. Not a single person. <laughs> Wait, I just want to say the yoga talent show does not feel like a natural fit. If I can just throw that out there, like yoga is very like, no one wins, no one loses. We're not putting on a show. Everyone is doing their best. And now showcase your talents. I just would like, I'm not exactly surprised that no one signed up, but keep going on with the story. I think it was because it was this month long teacher training. So it was sort of like a way to let off steam. Sure. Totally. Saturday. Yeah. Um, but so no one volunteered. One person volunteered. And so all week, everyone's like reading the Bhagavad Gita and like waking up at 4 a.m. and chanting. And I'm like, what are we going to do about this talent show? <laughs> 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 <That's true. laughs> um, and so finally, the night before, because no one's going to perform except for one person, I wrote a monologue. I wrote a monologue called Let Your Hair Down. Mm. It was full of. Um, inside ashram jokes that are not funny outside of an ashram Got but it. i i just decided i had to if nothing was going to happen i had to create something so get to the day of everyone's exhausted because again they've been waking up at 4 a.m and uh it's like 6 p.m on a saturday 8 p.m something like that on a saturday and i was so nervous and i went up there and i was like this is gonna be really bad and i did it anyway and by the end, people were up on their feet. Someone started drumming like this whole thing happened and it was magic. And so I introduced the one act I had and walked off stage and then got bum rushed by 20 people who all now wanted to do their talents. Wow. So, so I, but none of them were ready. So I started like making up little skits and bits between each act so that the next act could be ready. And it was engaging the audience and engaging the other performers. And I realized I felt like my best, most present self and not worried about the past and not worried about the future when I was performing and of service to others. And writing was a big part of that because writing, it, it's funny, I didn't think about this until you asked that question, but writing was the way I was able to show up and get that ball rolling to be yeah. able to create this space to invite more people. And so, how, I mean, I, I can interrupt you, Adrian, because I think it's so beautiful that you had the beautifully live version of unlocking people's fervent creative desire. Like I have nothing. I can't say anything. I can't do this. And all of a sudden they see you and they're like, you just like made it the permission slip you gave them was huge. And I can just see, of course, it's like left an imprint on you and influenced whatever came next. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what you're about to tell me, but I can only imagine like, woof, look, I can do that. Like that's an incredible feeling. Congratulations on that moment alone. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it really became it it really became sort of a cornerstone of how I understood my place in the world. And what I understood was sort of my um I I suppose the phrase I would use now is zone of genius. Like that's what yeah. I love creating and I love empowering other people to create. Um so after that, I you know, I Lit, I, I studied uh, uh, Kung Fu at a Shaolin Academy in China because I thought I wanted to be an action star. <laughs> so I was like, Great. Let's go to the source. I love um, it. And then I, <laughs> I went to New York uh, and studied at the Atlantic Theater Company. And their big emphasis is also on creating your own work. Um, they really encourage uh, classes to form an ensemble, which, you know, our, we, we did one show together. It didn't end up being the thing, but it really left me with the idea of, oh, I can be in control of my creative career. I can have something to say. I don't have to wait for the yes. I can make the yes. Got it. Yeah. Um, and so I, then I came out to LA for a, for um, like a six week acting program. And I just felt like, oh, this is the place. Great. Um, and when we started working together, I had shot um, I had shot a short film called Mira Mira that I had written, um, and uh, I, I wrote it and I shot it and I was sort of stuck. I couldn't really move forward. Um, and and, that and wait, Adrian, I can I ask you about something? I'm going to interrupt you because no, I please. feel like a lot of times when we create something, and I talk this happens a lot. I think with my filmmakers, my writers, we write, we make something, we might have put it into the world a little bit, but we're like, it's you know, it's not finished with its journey, and it is like an open. It's like a stuck. It's like stuck in your craw because you're like, yeah, it's done, and it, some people have seen it, but I know there's. It's not done with its impact. Is that the moment you're describing right now? 
It's actually a little bit before that. It was shot, but not edited. It was shot it. and okay. I was stuck because I had this, you know, I, I'd gotten people, I'd raised the money, I'd gotten people together, I'd shot it, but I didn't have, I sort of didn't have the clear next steps on what to take. Mm. So I felt very stuck. Um, mm. And you really helped me with the accountability and clear next steps and someone who cared to make sure that it got done <laughs> outside of myself. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to have someone who says, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> right. know, someone says, is it done? Did you do the thing you were do last week? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I felt very much like you doula that out of me. <laughs> yeah. so thank you. Great. I will gladly be a doula. Great. <laughs> um, and that ended up, um, it went to, a, a, it, I think it won the experimental award at some film festival or something like that. Um, but that was sort of the first thing. Oh, right. That was another big thing that led to my writing was um, it was a fairy tale about race and disconnection set in Bahia, Brazil. And I, you know, as a black woman growing up in the Midwest, uh, I, I, I had um, struggled with identity a little bit and who I was and what my place in the world was. And so I really started to connect with writing as a way to, as a writing, as a way to carve my place in the world and to tell my story um, and how empowering that was for other people to start having space to tell their story. So again, it was me realizing, it was that permission slip again, realizing, oh, when I give myself permission, it gives other people permission. Um, so I did that for a while in LA. I worked at a, um, a boutique production company that shot reels for actors. Uh, oh, so, yeah. uh, that, that was kind of like my grad school. So I got used to writing scenes, producing them, directing them, editing them, kind of like going through all the steps. And, yeah. um, and that was really big. And then the other big critical piece of the puzzle, I have to shout out to Ali Chan, who yeah. um, became my uh, creative partner and writing partner because she had a great idea called Quirky Female Protagonist. Um, we read it once out loud um, after a yoga class, actually. <laughs> Welcome back to yoga. Um, we read it aloud for our yoga teacher. We were the only two people in the class. And she was like, oh, this is really good. And I said to her, uh, "You, we have to make this. And so I kind of became her creative doula. I'd have her come over and say, okay, I, I want to see another scene by the end of our time together. And she would write it and I would edit it. And it really, again, I realized how much I, I love seeing things through to fruition. So I became the exec producer. Mm. She wrote it and we starred in it together. And after that, I proposed a creative collaboration and she accepted. And we became writing partners for the subsequent eight years, which was such a gift. Got it. Wow. Yeah. 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 And then, so how does it go from, Hey, let's make this thing. And when you say make it, meaning wrote it in, produce it on your own, just so that our audience is really up to date with when you said quirky female protagonist, when you took that, was it like, go produce our own or let's go get money. What happened next so that we can get connected to when you started pitching to TV, like connect the dots for us just a little bit. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so let's see, we did a Kickstarter back then and we raised something and, and, and Allie took the lead on that. And we raised, I think about $2,000. So it wasn't a lot. It was, it was just something just enough. And I had at that point, a lot of friends because I'd uh, in, in just who had a camera, like it, you, you, things don't have to be perfect. You just yes. have to be able to, to get it done. And yeah. so from there, we shot it. We edited it. That also took a long time again because I, I think we were kind of stuck in our own stuff for a little bit. And um, from there, we submitted it to a film festival. We submitted it to the LA Film Festival. And this is the big, mm -hmm. one of the big things that I love to say is that it's so helpful to, um, like people want to get on a train that's already moving. And so mm. we had to believe our train was already moving, you know? So yeah. we got, once we, so once we submitted to LA Film Festival, we got in, then we um, reached out to like a baby publicist. Like she was just starting to get into <laughs> being a publicist. And it was yeah. like, okay, do you want to like help us tell people about this web series? She was like, okay. So she charged a very low rate because she was new at it. And um, that really changed the game for us because it helped us get on to Huffington Post and NPR. So suddenly each after we created something that was important to us, we just kept enlisting more and more people. And the more people that got on board, the more people wanted to get on board because we could point mm -hmm. to someone else. Like, Look, they got on board. Don't you want to get on board to this train? Yes. 
Yes. And so at the LA Film Festival, we met, um, it's, I think festivals are a great place to start meeting people. So we ended up meeting someone who was at Lakeshore Entertainment. They do the underworld movies. And we, I, I think we barely talked about the project. It was really, we, we like danced together. We chatted, like we had a great time. She was like, I really like you guys. I think you should meet my boss. And so that led to our first general meeting. So general where you're just mm. getting to know each other and getting, to, we got to know what Lakeshore was trying to build. They got to know our voice and who we were. But so when they were ready, they were saying, oh, we're going to step into TV. We want to produce a TV show. What do you have? They knew our voice already and came to us and say, hey, do you have a TV pitch? Well, we did not have a TV pitch at the time <laughs> that they asked us that question. I want to be very clear about that. That was a very busy week. A uh -huh. gallery, full TV pitch. Got it. Yes. But that led to us optioning our first TV show. Got so it. it was, it was a lot of, again, being able to show up as ourselves and knowing what our voice was and what we were about. And that started attracting opportunities to us that were right for us. Yeah. Uh, but at least right for that moment too, because that show didn't right. end up getting made. And that was really disappointing. But out of that show, not getting made, we actually got an idea for an even bigger show. And that's the show that, that sold to CBS. So kind each of. valley led to another peak. And that was another yeah. big part of the, the writing process. For us. And Adrian, and realizing that, this that is we could take yeah. the, oh, oh, just to finish this last song, I'm sorry. Just no, to, do that it. the things that were our greatest obstacles turn into the stories that we can tell and turn into our greatest strengths. That's another big thing I believe in. That is beautiful. And that, that must be probably what you're talking to people about whenever you're helping them talk about their own pitches is, you know, are you really talking about what's real to you? Or is this just some idea that has nothing to, like, if it's not a, not clear to you, it's not real for you. And what I'm hearing you say though, also, and I think everyone needs to hear this is it's so beautifully articulated. People want to get on a moving train. Y'all getting your train moving. Isn't that hard? Like, it's not as hard as you'd like, get it into a film festival. Oh my gosh. Your train looks like it's moving. Like the people on the outside are like, Oh my gosh, it's moving. Like they have no idea that, Oh, by the way, this festival isn't hard to get into. Like, I'm not making that story up about you, but like some festivals aren't hard to get into. Like it needs like, we just need to see that it gets a little bit of street cred. So we can say like, Oh, it's been there. Like I can say, yes, that that's a festival. There's going to be people there who are hustling. Hustlers go to film festivals. Everyone in that room is hustling anyway. Right. And so you get to be around people who are, actually wanting to make things and do things or they wouldn't be there right unless they're the friends of the filmmaker fine right yeah like and you have to just remember and that's what i love about that we're gonna say adrian i was just gonna say this just hits on one of my close friends works at i'm not sure what i'm allowed to say so i'll just say a okay. big studio okay and right. she just told me they they had like a company-wide call and one of the things they mentioned they're now combing tiktok looking for time like it is so like it's people's full-time job to be watching tiktok to find who has a voice that they want to hear i'll take a check full -time i job. watch tiktok like, i feel like i watch it <laughs> i feel like i watch right? i can tell you like, talented on tiktok i could tell you right now <laughs> <laughs> so okay I think they I, have to do all these things has to be perfect it's like babe make it make it tiktok and show up and like really put your voice out there it's so much more accessible even than when i first started yeah you know yeah. And what I'm hearing, Adrian, though, because I think a lot of people might hear that and go, oh, my God, I don't want to become a TikTok star, which is what someone might hear. And what you're actually <laughs> saying is you don't have to be a TikTok star. You just have to get it started. What, get it started. Don't get it perfect is something that I always say that one of my coaches taught me is like progress, not perfection over progress over for perfection. And I hear you saying that. And then also what I love this and I want to underline this for everyone listening again is it that our show, they didn't picked up our show and that didn't happen. The CBS show ha didn't happen. Then we thought of another idea. But what happened is that one that didn't get picked up was street cred. Hey, I pitched a show to this channel. It didn't happen. And th the business knows, oh, yeah, TV shows don't happen all the time. Like, of course. Like, but that's as far as you got. Like, we know this is, like, so normal. But now you've been through. Like, it just gives you a little bit of, like, qualification to, oh, yeah, you know the ropes. Like, you've been here. But, like, we, you've, you've sold something to them and they didn't do it. We me too. I've just sold 15 things and they did only four, one of the 50, right? Like the normalcy of this business doesn't mean every effort you put in equals a, an equal action back. I think the business understands that more than sometimes the creators inside of it do. Like yes. we expect oh, that this, so everyone well knows it's a hard business. Everyone knows that like, I want to say hard. I don't like to apply the word hard to, but like everyone knows that the business is about trying, seeing if it works, trying, see where try this, try this, try this. Like it's going to be that that is part of it. And that you're saying, yeah, in the, ability to track your almost 
is such a great way to get the next one right. And so then, Adrian, so at that point, uh, you've pitched a bunch of other shows. How, can you give us just a little bit of input, in, input into, since you, now you teach people how to do this, like, what has this taught you? Like, what, what, is, what is the big takeaway that you have from being through this process? So many times, I would say. So there's oh, a lot the to say at the end of that way. question, but like, what, like, what if you were like, <laughs> you know, what has it taught Adrian, Adrian Rose White personally, like about yourself even? Oh, okay. I think it's taught me. And I know that I said this before, but I'm just going to give it like a very specific example of this now that the thing that I think is the obstacle is generally going to be either the answer or my superpower. Like whatever I think mm -hmm. is the thing holding it up is actually not holding it up. It's actually the best part. So I'm going to give you an example. Yeah. So I was pitching another show to CBS last fall. Um, and I, I took my dog. I took my dog out for a walk right before I was like, let me get my dog settled. Let me get everything settled. Let me, let me get in prime Adrian space. It was a zoom pitch. I take this dog outside and for some reason he has a problem pooping. He like can't finish or he's like stuck. Yeah. I won't get too graphic, but I was like, I have a pitch and check. Like you got to figure this out, Bo. I got to go. <laughs> he's like, I got to go too. I can't help with this. So I bring him back inside. I end up laying at like a pee pad under my desk. And I'm just at the beginning of this call. I'm like, my dog is shitting under my desk. <laughs> like just. <laughs> and I was like, and, but it's so funny because I think that could have been something that distracted me or really threw me off or felt weird. And I was like, oh, no, this is the obstacle that is supposed to charge me in and make me deliver. And I'll tell you, if that wasn't one of the best pitches I've ever done, <laughs> because I was just, I was, I was so stressed before, like, oh my God, what, what am I going to do about this dog? Like, I can't leave my, I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't know. It's like, let's just accept that this is happening and that it's going to make this pitch better. And we got the call the next day that it's home. So that is amazing. Yeah. I, I have learned that the things that feel like they raise the stakes that make it feel uncomfortable or impossible are actually, for, I'm like, oh, that if I treat that as a gift as, Oh, this is just hopping up my adrenaline so I can be even more tapped in the mm -hmm. results are amazing. That is so awesome. now I, try I love the way you say that a lot of times someone will come to me, it'll be an actor or a writer and they'll say, I'm not sure about how to handle that, 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 that. And I'll be like, well, you just talked about what the solution is. The problem is the solution is a phrase that we use a lot. Like you're just going to use that. You're going to use that. That's the answer. So talk to us about, for those of us who are not in the know, when you say sell a show, you don't like it to like set up a lemonade set on the side of the stream and be like, Hey, want to buy my show? Like what happens? No. Like, like, and like, I know you said this was a zoom meeting. I'm assuming that maybe some of them have been actually in person as well. Like who's in the room? What does it look like? Is it always the same people? And are you like, showing all these beautiful pages of pictures that you've made as like a pitch deck, or is it actually the script? Walk us through, what does it mean to sell a show like from A to Z? Give us a little bit of that journey. Brian, that is such a good question. And I cannot wait to tell you the answer because I, I love to demystify this process because people think it's so unattainable and it's not. So there are sort of three different types of people to pitch to. There are production companies. I group people who have overall deals, which I'll explain in a second. So production okay. companies and people with overall deals, studios, so studio and networks. So let's start with production companies and people with overalls. So they're the people that tend to package a project and they like to get involved at the earliest stage. So um, when I, I mentioned that pitch to Lakeshore, they, they were a production company. So basically when you go into a production company, they're really... I mean, at every stage, they're buying into you. But then in particular, it's about, I thought I had to go in with pages and pages. I thought I had to have a perfect pitch deck. I thought, I thought everything had to be done and ready to go. But no, wait, actually, and were you, and were you like totally ready to go? Or did you have all these things like, and here I am ready on the first day of school. And then you're like, oh, I didn't yes, need I, all this. Um, like, <laughs> you've met me. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> like, I have like 15, <laughs> totally. 20 pages. Yes. Um, we end up having, uh, I'll talk about Lakeshore specifically, we ended up having this two hour conversation because they liked us and they liked the core of the idea, but they mm. had their own ideas about what they 
what they were interested in, what they wanted it to be. So at the production company stage, it was a lot more collaborative than I realized. And a lot, mm-hmm. like I didn't have to come in with the perfect finished product. I needed to come in with the the inspiration and, you know, and follow up ideas, but enough to like spitball together and together find what we, we could do and what, what yeah. was exciting for everyone in the room. And Adrian, so, I'm also, you also you have to show up. You also had to show up with a willingness to be like, my answer is not the final answer, or like my vision is not the final. Like a willingness to like, it's not so precious to me that I can't listen to what else the people at the production company want to offer. So that can be tricky for people who, this is my personal story, and I have to tell it this way. And da, da, da. right, yeah. So I just I was just speaking into so of the three categories, are the production companies the most likely to say, and we have opinions about how we want this to be done. Yeah, I mean. I- I won't lie to you. Right. Everybody does. Got opinions about how they <laughs> but, but I do think um, they're they're the ground floor people. They're the they're the people I find because it, you know obviously a lot of times you want to get a sale, so you come to them and you want them on board. But you also need to see like, do we vibe? Do we do we have a similar vision for what we want this to be? So it's I consider it's a dance. It's not like I'm doing this and get on board nothing. But it's also like I. It's also not I have to do everything you say because you're right. It's like okay, we're two different. It's almost like a date, you know. It's like okay, uh, yeah. we have two different ideas of what we want. Do our ideas align enough that we want to that we want to keep doing this? Got it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, it, so the most important thing at the production company stage is knowing what the core of your idea is and that you can communicate that core effectively so you can find out if they're on board with that because you can build from there if you Got have, it. if you know what's at the center of it. So, okay. It. Now people with overalls, I love people with overalls. So I'll tell you an overall deal is where a network or a studio has paid someone up front. And their job is now to bring the studio or network ideas for a fixed amount of time. So an o- a person with an overall is looking for ideas to be, because that's their job, to bring ideas to the studio or the network that has that has offered them that deal. Um, so that's why I, uh, my first set, like, mm, I say, what, two, two, or, yeah, two of the projects I've sold um, were through people, like I pitched it to the person with the overall, sort of a very soft, loose pitch got them on board, had, saw what our vision was together, built something out a little more fil- fully, and then from there pitched to a studio. Okay. Got it. And so as an overall, just so I get extra clarity, your kind yeah. of thing like overall and production company are similar in the way that you approach them because it is mm-hmm. a collaborative kind of situation. Like, and overall might even be someone who like has their own production company in that case, yes, correct? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Got it. Great. And, um, and production companies, again, why would you go to production company? Because they have relationships with the studio or network. The goal is the network and all these other things are like plate people who have relationships and can build it out so that you get to that network sale. Got it. Got it. Got um, okay. So production company, um, next is a studio. So the studio, they're the people who will actually make the show. Um, and, the, uh, and the network, they're the people who will distribute the show. So a lot of people get a little bit confused because there's CBS studio. So they're the CBS studio, for example, would be the one shooting, filming the project, but CBS network is the one who puts it on TV. Like when you watch TV, you're watching uh, CBS network. Right. Um, Does that make sense? Bernie? It does. But I want you to talk about a little bit more because are you saying that CBS studios has money to say, we like your pitch and CBS network has money to say, we like your pitch Two separate things that could like, could one green light and not the other. Good. That's a really great question. So generally, especially for a first time project, you get what's called an if come deal, so, which means if you get, I like to explain it as if you get the network on board, then the money is coming. So at the <laughs> studio, so at the studio stage, that's where you get the contract that says, okay, when the network's on board, you get paid $100,000 to deliver the first pilot script and you'll get 5,000 per episode as an executive producer and 10,000 per episode as the writer and all like the at the studio stage that's when you get that contractual breakdown of uh-huh. um of what you will get paid but you don't actually get paid but they're saying we'll pay it once you get the network on so then once it. you get so then the network so by the time you're pitching to the network you already know the deal terms so once it sells to the network then the studio pay like this the network pays the studio and then the studio pays you. Mm-hmm. And some more questions. Yeah, when I some more questions, that's super interesting. So it's kind of like a test deal when you're an actor. 
Cause like, I remember when I tested at ABC. We had this whole deal of like, if this show goes, you have to be this person. This is how much you're going to get paid every episode. Blah, 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 blah. I remember like that was like the, so, so different, but a little similar, but is CBS its own entity? Meaning like, Hey, we love this Adrian show. We're going to like put, let's, let's put this thing together. Let's put it up. Or do they have to go, Hey, CBS, we're just checking in with you. We have the show we might want to do. Do we need to talk to them? Do they have to talk to each other before CBS no, can green talk- light a thing? Great. I love well, it. Oh, green light. Great. So, so the studio will give you the if come deal based on believing that they can, they'll find the network to put it on. So, and, and it's another great question because in the past in Hollywood, you might see something shot by CBS studio, but then distributed by NBC network. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like the, there would be a lot more of that crossover right now. It's a time of a lot of vertical integration. So um, the, the expression I hear used a lot is walled gardens. So CBS is owned by Viacom. So at this point, if someone were to get CBS studio on board, they would probably, they would not even probably almost definitely stick to a network inside the Viacom co- right. family of companies. Uh, right. So you, okay, you, okay, yeah. you, yeah, you, you can't, you don't get to, go as many places as in the past right now right at this moment in got the it. industry yeah got it and when you're doing these pitches may i don't want to cut you off so you can cut me off if i, I would who are you talking to who are these people who is it the who, i mean i get the production company like maybe it's the owner or it's the person had to develop like who are the people in the law in this who's populating this situation yeah so um at the production company a lot of times the first time you pitch to might be um, even a lower level exec. Sometimes it's the head of the company. I, uh, you know, my course is called how to actually sell a TV show organically, because I'm a big believer in finding the organic connections. So a lot of times that first pitch isn't even, it's not really a pitch. It's a coffee date. It's, it's something mm. very low key between two people where I get to talk about what I'm excited about and they yeah. get excited so that by the time by the time I'm actually pitching to the production company, I am pitching to the boss because whoever I've talked to already, we had that organic thing, and I gave them the the clear nugget that they could take to their boss, so that they're yeah. already excited by the time I come into the room. Well, and then um, you get to walk into the room all hot and confident and like certain because it's already been like vetted enough for you to be there, is what I'm also hearing. Like I'm imagining that in our this is like a great, this is like the, the way you want to be able to magically show up, not magically, but like for you, like the magic that gets to happen when you know you're wanted or you know that room is excited to meet you. Exactly. Because that, that's why I'm, I'm a big believer in finding aligned partners, because you want to find the people that that you get to you get to both be excited about this project. Exactly. And so the more clearly you can communicate it so someone can say right away, oh, yeah, that's for me. Or, oh, that sounds cool, but that's not for me. When you know that, then you're not coming into this cold room with unclear premises. Like you're just everyone's on the same page from jump. And I think that yeah. that just smooths the road for everybody. Yeah. Um, so you might pitch to so you're good, probably produce uh, pitching to like, um, yeah, maybe a head of development, maybe some an executive of some kind. It's usually the usually first pitch is like maybe one person, maybe two people. Um, by the time, so so that's with the production company. Then you go to the studio. So that's a little bit different. I would say your one your your team from the production company is now with you in the room. They're probably not saying a whole lot, but they're there. But now you're pitching to maybe three or four people who are executives at the studio. Okay, so it's like a big, it's a fuller room at this point. Um, now once you get Wait, what are you wearing? Like, what's the vibe of the clothes? Are we giving business casual? Like, is this a conference room? Like, I want to get, I want to really set the scene. Okay, so I'm, I pitch as an actor also. So I generally write a role for myself in what I'm pitching. So when I show up, I'm not in costume, to be clear. Don't show up in a doctor's outfit. (laughs) This audience is way too advanced to ever do that, but I'm glad you put the warning in there. (laughs) Like, in case it's someone's first time listening to this podcast, don't do that. Yes. But I do tend to dress in a way that evokes the character that I've written in there for myself. Because the idea is also to be, I want them to to watch that pitch and be like, I can't imagine anyone else being that character. Like, it right. has to be her. So I try to dress in a way that evokes that without being, you know, like the yeah. the intersection of me and that character. Got it. Um, what are the yeah, people on so the other side it, of the table wearing? Are they wearing business clothes? Yeah, but they're wearing LA business clothes. Right, exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, I totally yeah. get it. So, so you yeah. don't need to show up in like a suit and a yeah. unless that's if that's who you are, then absolutely do that because you do need to show up as you are. But I would say much, and I think this is similar to like when you're going to meet an agent in person who you're thinking about being your agent. You don't need to don't dress in like the perfect way that dress as you dress so that they can get to know you and see if this is really a fit. Correct, um, correct. Yeah, because yeah. that's what's gonna that's what's compelling is your authentic self that your authentic right. story. So be that. Right. Um, and so then by the time you get to the network, so now you got whoever was your executive from the studio and maybe one other executive. And now all those producers from the production company are all there now too. And now at the network, you're probably talking to like somewhere between four and six people. Okay. Like it could be one, but it's probably more. So by this time I, I lost count, but it's probably like 15 <laughs> people in the room. And, and, is, and um, they're all in the room and you're the main talker. And you're the main talker. Yeah. 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 Um, and if you're pitching with, you know, generally, because again, that's, this is so much about relationships. So probably the studio already has a relationship with this network. So very likely the studio person is going to introduce, and then they'll introduce your producing partner. And then the producing partner will introduce, be like, we met this way. And, you know, she re- knocked me, knocked, knocked my socks off with blah, blah, blah. And then it'll be like, you know, it's this sort of, build because again it's this chain of relationships you kind of go through the chain and then you get introduced and then you know you do your you, you do, do your, your thing pitch. and how produced is the pitch is it really you sharing and talking or is it actually like and now let me show you all of my pitch decks and here's my script like what is the what is the vibe at that stage i think by the time you're at the network it there's a pitch that you, you have a visual deck you're very clear it's tight you're by that time you you need to be very clear on what you're doing and you're you're selling them on a show you're really selling them on a show at this point now that said there's a conversational part afterward so you you want it to feel conversational but but it should be rehearsed you should be clear on what you're saying if it's funny the pitch should be funny if it's dramatic the pitch should be dramatic like you really want to you want to know your project so well that the tone of the project is very clear to everyone who's in the room because that's a big part of what's going to get them on board. Wow. That is so cool. That is so cool. And so um, it just in the way you described it, is it a one, two, it's not always a one, two, three, right? You could start with the network or you could start with the product. You could start with the production. You could start with the studio, depending on where your relationship or who you met is. Cause you said it's about organic. Exactly. Is that true? And so I, and, and it's true. It's, and here's the thing that I, I, I just, I want everyone to hear from the bottom of my heart to the bottom of theirs. This career is not linear. Like I think people get in this idea of there's a certain path to follow. I need to be a staff writer first. Oh, I have to start with the production company. If I had believed any of that, I don't, I would never have sold my first show because the way I did it was completely different from how people talk about it, but it was the way that was authentic to me. So it's very much about what is authentic to you, who is in your circle already, how do you approach things, and like you can find your own path from there instead of feeling like you have to follow these set steps. Yeah, um, I love so that. yeah, if I someone if someone has a relationship with a network, oh my god, golden goose, yes, go to the network first. What they might say because they have they have relationships with the production companies you can go to the network and they can say you know what i think you should go to this production company they'd be perfect for it maybe the network will come on board and then it's super easy to find another partner maybe they'll say go to them first and then come back to us we want you to develop it with them and then come back but so there there are so many ways that it can happen and i'm a big believer in um the people who are rooting for you the most are the people who already know you so if you already have a relationship somewhere that is absolutely where you should start that's the right. Yeah. That's interesting, Andrew, because I think that we, the way we perceive this is a lot of gatekeeping. And what I'm hearing mm-hmm. you say is they might say, we like you and you're not right for us yet. You should go here because they're going to help you do this further like that. Because I, what we might see as a creator is, well, I don't have anything to offer. I just got this pilot. Who cares? I just wrote this thing. Who cares? They have all the money. They have everything. Da, 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 da. What am I offering here? So why would they even bother to say anything to me, why are they, buy, right? And so it comes all the way back to what you said earlier is they want to move on a moving train. They want to get on a moving train. Like it's a little bit like, well, you got to have your idea together enough. Like you said, that core idea that you talked about for the production companies enough for someone to say, oh, I can understand it. I can understand what your vision is. And I can, now I can have opinion about it, but you've got to take, do that work. And I'm imagining Adrian, you tell me if this is correct. When someone's going to production company, and they have a core idea. Are you suggesting maybe like, you like, 
flesh it out as far as you can, like write a script and then throw it away when you go to the meeting or how far prepared do you think they need to be to be able to go there and really like show up with their, with the POV on their own project? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so I will say, I'll say two things. So first of all, I know shows that were sold based on a sentence written on a napkin, but that is generally from people who already have you know, they have um, a track record. So they say, oh, I know you can write a show. This core, you who I've seen do other things, who now has this core idea, I'm on board. Sold. Yes. Now, if you don't have anything to back it up yet, you do, you do need a, you do, I always say this, you don't need to have a script for the concept that you're selling, but you do, you do need a script in general to prove that you can execute if you're pitching yourself as a writer, for example, because then your job is to write a script. They're going to be like, okay, show me a script you wrote. Um, Wait, can you say your question one more time? I was about to go well, on a whole different yes. tangent. No, I'm just, so what I'm saying is, you know, like we talked about how the production company is probably the most collaborative moment, right? Where you get to be really like, let's get to my core idea. And I'm just saying, I can see a lot of creators who are like, well, I need to be prepared. How do I prepare? And like yourself, you said like, I had taken all my school supplies there and I probably didn't need to. I was really prepared. I got my 20 pages. Da, da. How do you uh, coach people on that first, like be clear on your core idea? What would be the practical parts? Is it like write out your whole first season, write out that first episode? Is it, you know, write the script and then throw the script away so you can go in that meeting feeling free? How much do you, because I don't think that everyone's going to be able to do the Stephen Levitan, write it on a napkin kind of thing because they don't have a track <laughs> record yet. Right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so I would say going into a production company, two things I think are really great are one is a one sheet. So a one sheet is just a one page document that really gets that has, you know, a log line, um, the premise, main character, where you see the show going, like just really clear, like something gripping, but really specific. And usually that's helpful for even getting that first meeting with a production company, because then they clearly know what your idea is. Yeah. And so then let's say you make that one sheet. Um, and, you know, I could give you a formula for a one sheet, but I always come back to how this career is not linear and like make something different. And, you know, who knows? Um, Lena Dunham, I don't know if people have seen the one sheet for girls, um, but it's interesting because she doesn't list a single name on there, but it's very much about this tone and this vibe and what she's seen missing from the marketplace and what people are craving. And that's another big thing. Like executives are always looking for like, how do I know there's an audience for this? So if you can concisely communicate what the idea is and who the audience is for it, that, that helps get the meeting. I and mean, that's what executives are really looking for. And that's yeah. if you're meeting with a lower level executive, that's what they're going to use to pitch to the boss. So if you're clear on that, you got, got it. it. That's the most I essential that. thing. Do that homework, take that um, and run to the bank with it. Yeah. That's great homework. Yeah. yeah. And then for, um, for a pit, so let's say you got the meeting, you're in the pitch meeting, what do you need? Um, let's see, I usually start with like a little, uh, like an introduction, like kind of what, how I decided to tell this story, like what, it, what authentic inspiration from my life drew me to telling this story into, um, let's see, I'll talk a little bit about the, the maybe max five care, let people hear this, hear me, less is more. <laughs> It is hard to follow a story. If you got 12 people in the story, ain't nobody following it. Five max. Got it. The, the, you know, maybe the five main characters, kind of what their relationship dynamic is into maybe the plot of the pilot episode. Again, in a couple of paragraphs, like succinct, clear. Yes. Um, And then kind of like a, and you say this at the beginning, but coming back to the why us, why now? And who's the, like, why does the world need the show? Who's the audience for that show? And then kind of, you know, where we see the characters going long-term in the future, like we call that story area. So what are the, so what, now that we've in this pilot set up this engine of what the problem is or what we're dealing with, where, where, where are kind of the, the highlights of where we're going to go from there. Got it. Um, I love and then it. I like, yeah. Yeah. So I think if you yeah. hit those points in your initial, in your initial production company pitch, you, you really have what you need for them to know if it's something they want to get on board with. Yeah. Cause what I, the way I'm related to this is like, I'm thinking about like, if you go to a restaurant and there's a big thing of guacamole, we'll have to like agree, like we can, this is guacamole. See that it is green. We have to have enough acknowledgement. <laughs> like if you brought some dish and it was this brown thing or like, I don't know what this is. They need to at least know what it is enough to be able to start the conversation around. That may not be the best analogy, yeah. but what I'm taking from it is they need to, there needs to be enough there 
There's be enough there there for you to have a conversation, enough for them to jump into what it is, right? So you're like, I have this idea, yeah. crazy idea for a TV show, like the one that your aunt gives you when you visit her in Ohio. It's probably not the same as what you're showing up to these meetings with, right? Yeah, exactly. So you want to have a th- and I will say, if if you want to do all the homework, that's great. Like, if, especially for your first one, you want to be able to watch. You'll be excited and maybe a little nervous. Um, I think nervous is just excitement. It's just the same feeling and how we contextualize it. Right. Um, but so if you do, you want to be able to talk in a way that's again, engaging. So that means do all the homework ahead of time and then walk in with these succinct pieces, but you know, the bat, all the other things. Yeah. So when they ask this question, you have an immediate, like, Oh, I thought about that. And I was thinking this and they'll throw something to you. And if you can take something that they throw to you, and build on it in the pitch meeting. I promise you, if you don't sell that show, you at least gonna get more pitch meetings because that's <laughs> what you. It's about feeling seen and heard, and it being a dialogue. So if you can dialogue uh-huh. it, as opposed to, and and, and I just want to add one other thing. Our queen Shonda Rhimes did a um, a master class on on writing and creating and selling a show, and she talks about pitching. And she mentioned the first show that she sold. Uh, Grays. I don't know if she's a first but she talked about. It. She mentioned she was so nervous. She had. Um, she didn't look up from her script once. She couldn't look at anyone. She just read the thing all the way through. And y'all, she still sold the show. So I'm telling you the things that I found that have helped me sell the show. But yeah. never let that be the thing where you're like, oh well, I'm not an actor, so I don't feel comfortable like talking with people. Okay. D- yeah. Do do you? But I'm I'm only adding what I have found very helpful for me and what has opened a lot of doors for me. But as right. always, there are many many paths and many ways, and this is just one more tool to put in your arsenal. Totally, I love that. If you were going to say like this is the this is so helpful, and Adrian and y- y'all know that Adrian like this is what Adrian does. She helps people do this through her courses and through the work that she does. So we're just like you know touching the iceberg here right now. But I want to see what is the device that you find yourself repeating over and over to people when they're in class with you or when you're working with them? Is there something you find yourself saying again and again? Mm, what do I find myself saying again and again? Um, I would say reciprocity makes relationships sustainable. So I think a lot of people have a lot of fear about reaching out. Um, Because they don't want to ask for something. They don't want to be the needy person. They don't, they don't want to overstep in a relationship. Um, And I think the biggest thing I always point out is that it's a relationship. So there's energy back and forth. So yes, if you're always coming like, can I have something? Can I have something? Yeah, of course, people don't want that. But if you go in like, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. Tell me about what you're, how can I help you? Oh, I'm working on this. I'm really excited about it. Like it allows for organic flow. So starting to treat your project instead of like a favor you're asking someone for and like really mm. about if it's, Hey, what are you, I saw you worked on this and that's really cool. Can you tell me more about that? Genuinely, not just to get to your, yeah, the fake, the, the fake authenticity is a real problem, but I, what you're saying is, yeah. So what this part, what this brings up for me, and this can kind of be a way we round this out today, Adrian, is like when we want to create relationships, it can't be just transactional. It has to be this production company works on shows that feel like the kind of shows that I mine might work with. I could be totally wrong with where they're going next, but that's where they've been. I would love to have a conversation with this person about how they developed that show. I'd love to know how that got made because knowing how the sausage was made for that show will let me know how to do my show mo better. And it's not about me selling my show. It's about like them sharing their story and how open are they to doing that. And so I'm imagining inside of your course and the way that you work with people, you're helping them like open those doors and go through all the gatekeeping and everything. But I just really want to underline, you know, what's the big surprise here? Brian Briggs character. We're talking once again about relationships and humanity being the the fuel that makes it all happen. It's, it's not a surprise to me, um, which is why you're the perfect guest for today, Adrian. I'm so delighted that you're here. And Brian, just before we round out, I have to say I can trace so, like I, you were one of the guiding lights that helped me get where I am. I can't say this strongly enough. I remember, I remember when you first gave, taught me that you know if you want to get something done, put it in your calendar. If you want to, I still, I remember you were talking about um, setting timers. Like, oh, yeah. if you were bringing a date home and your house is messy, and you're like, oh shit, they're in thirty here in thirty minutes. You can get that room clean in thirty minutes. <laughs> if you give her thirty and hours, I, and, never get it done. Yeah, exactly. And so that became one of the um, 
one of the really one of the core principles I've had is like set a timer if this is important set put time aside and work on mm. it and um you know I do these I have this digital community called in the flow and we have writing sprints and I'm a big believer in writing sprints because the the only thing you have to do during that time you can't stop writing you can write I hate this I don't know what to write over the, I don't recommend that but you can do that but the one rule is that during that time you have to keep writing and um and I can again trace that back to you of like setting aside that time getting out of your own way having community around that so I I have been um, just the biggest devotee over the years. And I can, re- I, I don't, I wouldn't have finished that film if it hadn't been for you. I don't think I would have met Allie. I don't think Quirky Female Protagonist would have happened if I hadn't met you. So I can really trace back a lot of my, um, a lot of my trajectory to you laying a great foundation of how to show up for myself and manage my time and build community. So I just oh. want to thank you so much. Adrian, I was not expecting this. If you're looking at this on YouTube, y'all can see me blushing. Thank you so, Adrian. I, I just so you know, I've been watching you. Just a little shout out, one more shout out to Adrian. Uh, that is, you know, I've been watching your star just ascend since I've met you, and I know that stars don't ascend just because the Earth's turning, but it's because you're also putting in work to match what the Earth is doing, what the universe is doing, and so it has been such a joy. And to hear that back just means it really means the world to me to know that I had some little voice in there somewhere. So thank you. So Adrian, I know people right now are probably jumping out of their skin to know how they can work with you, how they can learn more about it, how, can they, how they can get in the flow. Can you? I will share all of that into the show notes here. So if you want to just click on your phone to make this easy, but Adrian, can you say it out loud for those of us who are driving or jogging while we're listening? Yeah, absolutely. So for people who want to get to know me better, want to have some community, I have a free, uh, in the flow is free. We do weekly um, writing sprints. So we have a set co-working time to get online and work on our on getting a show sold. I say get in the flow, sell a show. So I alternate each week. One week I'll focus on one part on the creative side of devel- development. So I'll work on you know a pitch I'm writing or something on a deck I'm working on. And I will share personally what I'm working on this week and what happened last week. So you're getting the inside scoop of what's happening with someone actually working in the industry right now and what I'm what I'm seeing. Um, and then we'll have that work time. And then we have time to reflect on it. Oh, right. And then so one week on creative and then the next week we'll work on the business side. So whether that's um, finding the aligned partners or whether what, whatever the next step is for the business side, I'll share what I'm doing there. And then we'll have a set time. I'll tell you what I'm working on. You can do the same thing I'm doing. Or if you have your own step for your, pro- for your project, you can take that. But you'll have it in community. And I'll tell you, there is nothing like being around other people who are working to make you just be focused for that set amount of time. So I just wanted, I wanted some place that was free that anyone could come and get, get their shit done. Come get your yeah, shit done. Yeah. Wait, I can so, wait. Just so y'all know, get in on this before she starts charging, because that is so <laughs> valuable. I cannot, I'm like a gog and a ghast that Adrian's bringing all this expertise to this. So if you're listening and you're thinking about pitching a show, Go, go, go. I can't. Where can they, where can they sign up? So they can sign up. Um, if you come to my uh, Instagram at something truly brilliant, all one word for Instagram. And then at Adrian Rose White is my personal. Y'all can follow me there too, if you want. Right. But so then the other, the re- thing I'm really, re- that I just reshot, Brian, I'm so excited about is the actual course, how to actually sell a TV show organically. So that is relaunching May 1st. So if you are ready to actually have a container and instruction around getting your pitch done and getting your show sold to aligned partners, I encourage you to come through. Uh, I've, I've helped. I, I, I remember when I first met uh, after eight weeks of working with her, we sold to, she sold to uh, Netflix and Paramount. So I'm very big on how do you go from the idea to get it sold. So if you're ready to take that next step, I highly encourage you to come to how to actually sell a TV show organically. All right, y'all go reach out to Adrian, get on her email list, go to her free in the flow. And so you know when this May class launches so you can be a part of it. Thank you so much, Adrian, for today. And so all this, these wonderful, like, I feel like I got a whole master class. I'm like, I want to write a show now. I'm like, I'm ready to pitch a show now. Let me go on. That's my idea. Like, I'm fully inspired. I'm fully inspired already. But- Brian, I would be thrilled to help you put a show together <laughs> to pitch. That would be my greatest joy. So, so let's talk. We'll keep talking. We'll talk. Great. We'll keep talking. All right, y'all. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>